Yeah, man. How's it going? <clears throat> very, very good. Excellent. Uh, well, uh, I understand that you got a book coming out, so it seems like it's a great opportunity for us to play 20 or so questions for about the next hour. Yeah, about yeah. Let's do it. Absolutely. I, I saw your uh, your uh, your notes come through uh, and uh, talking about the Iranian hostage crisis. And yeah, that's a very early memory. We must be fairly similar in age because uh, my that's what some of my first memories as well mm -hmm. are seeing those uh, uh, those Americans blindfolded and seeing the you know, listening to Walter Cronkite count down the days and seeing the newspaper headlines and and all that. So um, so yeah, very very formative time for sure. Yeah, it certainly was. I think it changed my life. And, you know, as I look back on it, I realized there's even an event earlier than that, uh, very similar. But absolutely, I think it, it all relates to uh, freedom, wanting to maintain that freedom. And, and I believe firearms to be a tool that helps all people to maintain some sort of equality, as Samuel Colt said. Uh, nice. God created all men and Samuel yeah. Colt. I made them equal. equal. That's, right. That's we're not, right. We're not here to talk about me, but I'm glad that, that you know that, uh, that part about the Iran hostage crisis. And um, anyway, I'll introduce my, myself first, Sam Robinson with UtahGunExchange.com and UgeTube.com. That's UGE. Dot, I'm sorry, UGETube.com. Platforms for both the First and Second Amendment. And today we're going to spend about an hour talking guns with author and former Navy SEAL, Jack Carr, who also does a lot of other good in this world. And I wanna talk about some of that. So you've got a book coming out here in one week. That's uh, right. I'm hoping to have you introduce the character of that book in just a moment. And before we wrap this up, I'd really like to talk about some of the things that are important to you from a charitable standpoint uh, in regard to some of the people that, that you're trying to help and ways that people can also get involved to be able to help you help them in that cause. All right, let's do it. Perfect. So I understand that you were Navy SEAL for 20 years and you did just about everything that could be done. One of the jobs uh, that you did was a, a sniper. Uh, how long were you a sniper? Yeah, so uh, I went to sniper school and I got back from my first deployment. Uh, so I went to sniper school in 2000, spring, summer of 2000. Um, and uh, so typically you'd go to your team, you'd show up there, you, know, you think you're in back before 9-11, you thought you were going to immediately go on all these secret missions. Um, and uh, that was not the case. You uh, got to your first team and you cleaned bathrooms and empty trash and painted walls and turned, changed light bulbs and that sort of thing as a, as a new guy. But you go through that workup and during that time, usually you're chief of the platoon and people you are watching you as a new guy. You were on probation back then and uh, for like six months or so until you got your, your trident from the guys you were going to go down range with from your platoon. But uh, you typically see it, uh, it's very obvious like who the, the good shoot, shooters are uh, and who, who you should give the, the, the A-dub to maybe instead. Um, and, uh, and then after your first deployment, some guys would have to go before uh, that, their first deployment, but that would be the, uh, kind of the outlier. If somebody got sick or hurt or something like that before sniper school and they had a slot popped up for a certain team, then every now and again, a new guy could go. But typically it was after that first platoon. So got back from that first one and went to, I think it was 73 days of sniper school. And, uh, and then came back to my, my platoon and you continue your, your work up for about a, a year and a half before you go uh, down range again. And uh, so yeah, I was a, a sniper from, I guess, 2000 until, until I got out, but really it was a 10 year, ah. 10 plus year run as a, as a sniper at the, the tactical levels. Very cool. It's definitely going to relate to what we're going to be talking about today. So, um, anyway, obviously you, I think you're a Renaissance man, you're an intellectual, you're an author. Uh, you have done some tremendous physical feats and you're doing a lot of uh, very interesting intellectual endeavors. And I think it's, it's very good for a lot of young people to see role models like this in our society. And, and so I wanted to help get the word out and help get the word out about this book because I think that can bring a lot of people into the firearms community. And I believe that that helps our society as well. I think that when people become gun owners, they become less apolitical and they start caring more about other people trying to take their freedoms away. So yeah, I've they, noticed that too. That's definitely something that I've noticed over the over the years as well. Uh, there's just there is something about that, whether it's being you know around other people that uh, they weren't really exposed to before because of their social circles, mm -hmm. 
or just the responsibility of now uh, owning and knowing that you need to to train with this uh, firearm to be proficient to protect yourself and your family. Uh, so whatever it is, probably a combination of those of those things. Um, but you just take an interest, just like anything else. If you get a have an interest in in something, then all of a sudden you go deeper than that what you yeah. might have just uh, just had uh, you know an initial exposure to on the surface um, prior to taking that uh, that deep dive in. But you're right. There's uh, like growing up, we had in the '80s, we had you know you could turn on the TV. Okay, you could ride your bike to the video store, get a get a VHS, ride your bike home. Uh, you could read uh, or go outside, right. and climb a tree. Maybe Atari 2600, you know, but that only has, you only have a cer certain amount of time you can do that. You can't do that, uh, you know, all through the night uh, like people can today on some of these video games. But the influence of popular culture was strong. Um, and, uh, and it's not any less strong now. There are just more distractions. And I think a lot of those distractions aren't necessarily as... I don't know, I guess productive or even uh, don't incorporate some of those values that were, whether intentionally or not, uh, woven into some of the popular culture in the 80s. I mean, everything from, you know, G.I. Joe cartoons, those aren't there anymore. Knowing is half the battle, that stuff, the cartoons right. today, a little different. Yeah. Uh, even movies, even the ones that were, were not supposed to be uh, you know, pro-military, I guess, or even weren't supposed to inspire you to, uh, to join the military, kind of inadvertently did. And like, like First Blood or Rainbow First Blood Part Two, or even, even Platoon, um, you know, things right. like that. It was obviously way more, obviously very serious. Um, uh, but today I don't really see that in, uh, in a lot of the, the films out there, a lot of, the, a lot of popular culture. So, um, and I really enjoyed growing up reading books with protagonists that had backgrounds that I wanted in real life one day. So I'm reading books by guys like David Morrell, Nelson DeMille, AJ Quinnell, Jesse Pollock, Mark Olden, um, like all these guys whose protagonists had either like Vietnam experience as a SEAL, Vietnam experience as an Army Special Forces guy, or CIA guy, something like that. So I just had this, these great memories of reading these books as I prepared myself along my path. And so that's what I'm trying to do today. I always knew that I was going to go in the military, and I was going to write these thrillers afterward. But what I've done, and you may have noticed, is that, that I've woven a few things into the storylines um, to uh, address some of those th the things we just talked about here. So uh, I don't just have a character that all of a sudden is carrying concealed in California and just going going about his business, doing doing moving the plot forward. I talk about that. Well, is that is he carrying that illegally? How can he carry that thing in California? Right. Uh, and, and all of a sudden he's in a gunfight. Does he have more than 10 rounds in there? I don't even know where that stands now. I heard it went back and forth, but who knows? But point being, uh, I think about those things because I think about them personally if I'm in California. Uh, and so I weave some of these things into the into the storylines, like uh, uh, a little background in conservation, uh, hunting and conservation in the second novel. Uh, actually, in all of them a little bit. But what I want to do is someone who's grabbing these novels off the shelf on their way to vacation as they go through the airport or whatever. Yeah, they think they're grabbing a political thriller or a spy novel, which they are. But there's also some of these uh, these themes woven in that uh, that hopefully uh, make them open their eyes a little bit to, to some of the those issues from possibly a, a different perspective. So. Yeah. Uh, so I'm trying to use use this uh, this medium of uh, of popular fiction as a way to uh, as a way to influence the populace uh, because certainly the other side has done that very successfully from uh, gosh probably for the last 50 years uh, whereas our side has uh, stumbled along a little bit. Yeah, pop culture is tremendously influential, and it's so good to see a movie or read a book that is technically correct and the characters are proficient and the character development has been put into the character so that people who are of that ilk or want to be or are similar relate to it. And it also does a lot of good from a promotional standpoint. Speaking of which, uh, would you like to introduce your character, your main character? Sure, sure. So my main character is uh, James Reese, and he has a background fairly similar to mine in that he was a prior enlisted Navy SEAL sniper. Uh, somewhere along the way, he becomes an officer. And uh, then it, when the reader meets him in the first novel, The Terminal List, uh, which is the one that they're filming right now in L.A. for a series for Amazon, which is pretty cool. Um, he is at that point in his time in uniform where he's not going to tactically lead guys on the battlefield if he stays in the military any longer. So he's at that 04 level, which for the other services is a major. For us, it's a in the Navy, it's a lieutenant commander. And that's where I was when I came back from my last deployment as a troop commander. Um, and I picked my head up and realized my family needed me. We have a, a special needs middle child who needs 24-7 full-time care forever. So I picked my head up, 
realized my family needed me. Also realized, hey, if I stay in, I'm gonna come back as a team commanding officer, which sounds impressive, but in real life today, it means you're more of a manager. You're in a tactical operations center. If you go downrange, you're allocating assets, that sort of thing. You are not out there tactically maneuvering guys in the battlefield. You certainly aren't kicking any doors in. In fact, the guys don't even want you down in there anymore because you haven't done these workups and you've been out of it for a while. So you're just gonna go down and stumble around and mess things up if you go out with them anyway. Um, but uh, that's where I was when I started writing this story, or started creating this character. Um, so, of course, in the fictional novel here in uh, the terminal list, uh, the disaster strikes and the main character is uh, drawn into a uh, government private sector conspiracy uh, through which he needs to then start putting people in the ground. So, and I get to do that in a lot of creative ways. So it was a very therapeutic uh, novel to write, but um, <laughs> that's my main character. And uh, Chris Pratt is uh, portraying him in the series, which is uh, amazing. He's the only person I ever wanted to, to play my main character because I wanted someone who was likable and because he's going to do some very uh uh some things in the in the show and in the in, and does so in, in the novels that maybe the the reader or the viewer is going to need to uh to forgive him for or to continue on the journey so i wanted someone that was likable and when i thought about chris pratt he um he hadn't done avengers hadn't done guardians of the galaxy hadn't done jurassic world or anything like that he'd just been andy on uh, parks and rec and uh, he had a very small role as a seal in zero dark 30. Uh, so I thought of him from the outset, and so it's just crazy that he's now the one starring. Yeah, very interesting. It, it seems it was meant to be, but uh... crazy. And I thought of Antoine Fuqua directing, and he's directing. He's uh, he's just an incredible person. I was uh, on set with them all last week. Three hundred and fifty people on set making this happen. Explosions and stunt people, and just it was crazy. It was amazing to to see it come come to life. Yeah, uh, very neat to see books become a movie. And to have the people that you'd want producing, directing, and, and acting in them all come into play. It's fortuitous, and uh, I congratulate you on that. Oh, when, will the, when will the series uh, be coming out for the public to view? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly. I think sometime in 2022. That's, uh, but I don't think it, there's not a, a more uh, definite date yet. I'm sure it can always move around depending on what else is coming out. Maybe they shut down, have to shut down because someone gets COVID, and who, who knows? Um, so probably a lot of factors out there, but I think sometime in 2022. Right. Awesome. Well, let's, let's talk about uh, guns or freedom tools uh, for a minute. And I want to see if we can circle back to uh, bring a car or a truck or a watch, maybe a blade into this before we're done here too. I, I see behind you, uh, you've got what appears to be a very nice double barrel. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah, that there. So that is a uh, 1898 Parker up there. And I was in New Hampshire recently at, at, uh, at SIG. And we went on a, a hunt out there in New Hampshire, an upland um, hunt. And there was this little cabin from the 1800s. It was part of this club. And uh, so it was really small. So that the, you know, it was smaller back then. And, uh, and I saw this on the wall. And I was looking at it. And uh, the guy, owner came over and uh, said, hey, you want to take it down? I said, oh, yeah, I'd love to see it. So there's Damascus barrels. It's, uh, it's, it's wow. crazy. So, um, so I took it down. And, and, uh, and he said, hey, do you like it? And I said, yeah, it's amazing. Love it, and he said, uh, "Well, it's for sale," and I said, "Really?" So now it's on the wall, uh, and I want to take it on at least one hunt, <laughs> but, uh, but I want to uh, I want to get some low velocity loads for it because you know it's eighteen ninety eight. Mm -hmm. And is it, is it a Damascus twist barrel? Uh, gosh, I don't even know Damascus twist. I'm not even sure. Uh, yeah, they used, they used to take the rods. And... I'm not an expert in eighteen ninety eight. I do have a Lee Enfield eighteen ninety three that I brought back from Afghanistan. But because uh, you're allowed to bring things back, I think 1898 and before you could you could bring back without issues. Very uh, interesting. But, uh, yeah, no, it's beautiful. I mean, it is beautiful. And uh, it is. I can yeah, see it from here. One run. Yeah, one run. I want to take it on one hunt, low velocity loads, and then uh, put it back on the wall, probably. Yeah, you got to be able to shoot it, right? <laughs> yeah, we'll shoot at least at least one hunt with it. Yeah. I love the uh, the logo of the double T hawks, and I see that you've got a new one on the wall there as well. Yeah, so retirement. Yeah. I uh, got out of the military. One of my uh, dear friends got me that. Uh, you know, also Damascus on that one, and then uh, it's the Winkler tomahawk that uh, is uh, featured on the on the logo for 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 this uh, for this brand. And uh, this is crazy. This is this are, uh, these are casings right here. So oh, really, brass. <laughs> yeah, crazy. Oh yeah. So that's pretty cool. Uh, guy in Texas makes those. Uh, Matt Tumelson does that he made one for rogan uh with the big african who what that one was uh but uh so i got in contact with him and 
Now her now now that's on the wall. <laughs> Sensing a theme here. Very cool. Uh, I love repurposed art, repurposed material to create. But I guess it all is. Yeah, they've all been shot, so yeah, they're all you know they've all been shot, which is cool too. Absolutely. Well, so what was the first gun you shot? You remember that? Yeah. Well, I, a little twenty-two. Anyway. Yeah, a little twenty-two at uh, a summer camp. Uh, when I was five, I mean, it was BB guns then. So I was probably seven by the time I seven or eight, probably when I went to uh, the 22. Um, and I can't remember if I did something with my dad before that or after, but uh, but BB guns first, and then under into 22s, just single single shot 22s. Um, didn't really know what I was doing. I don't think they really gave us much uh, <laughs> much instruction back then. Um, but then I would go to the range with my dad. He had an old 22 that he got from a. Uh, Gosh, I'm gonna mess it up. I'm gonna mess it up. Um, it's the pump action um, uh, Winchester model. Eh, anyway, I don't wanna mess it up because everyone will correct me, especially on this. Everyone else will know. <laughs> but uh, he got that along with Let's a. Say it was uh, awesome. Yeah, uh, it was. It was yeah, really cool. I think it was from the 1920s. I want to say. Uh, and he, then he got a pre-64 30-30 um, from a pawn shop in, uh, I think it's Santa Barbara. Just walked in as a 12-year-old kid uh, and walked out with both of those. And a Colt Woodsman. I think he got them all at the same time. So wow. uh, so we shoot that. We shoot this old Colt Woodsman uh, and the, the, the pre-64 30-30, which I just took on a hunt last year, which was, was pretty cool, using that old, old thing, um, which was amazing. Uh, and it's old uh, pump action 22 that was... Uh, that was cool. I still have them. I still have all of them. Um, and uh, so those were the first ones. Those were, I grew up with those. And uh, and then later when I could uh, legally buy pistols, then I, I got a couple of pistols. And then I started, yeah, every chance I, I got, I, I would give myself a little gift when I got back from each deployment that was um, uh, always a firearm. I think it's a great gift. Uh, I highly recommend <laughs> people give more of them to people who are prepared and want to accept that, of course, and do it responsibly. So would you say that one of those uh, was one of the most influential or the most influential gun of your childhood? Or was there something else that came in later that, that really fueled your appreciation for firearms? Yeah, no, I, I was always... Uh, I was always so interested in firearms. Um, those are the only ones that we really had in the, in the house growing up. But, uh, you know, I always wanted more, which didn't, uh, didn't do that. Um, so I had to wait till I got old enough to do it myself. But uh, yeah, I was always uh, going through Soldier of Fortune magazine, and uh, I know you you did the same thing as well. Uh, there was a Gung Ho magazine back in the day, and I was I just you know loved those ads and loved uh, loved the HK ad ad in a in a world of compromise. Some don't have the guy dope. in the mud like crawling up you know over that log. Yeah. Uh, that thing was awesome. I want to uh, I need to frame that at some point and put it put it somewhere. But uh, uh, I love that I love that ad. That HK ad was 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 just really stood out to me. Um, and the other, HK did a great job back then. You know, they crushed it on the advertising back in the day. Uh, and then they had the Princess Gate um, uh, MP5. Got you know the guys. Uh, oh, nice. There you go. Hey, there it is. So, <laughs> it's the rifle. It's the rifle pistol. It's yeah. the rifle pistol, right? That, so, that's awesome. I do want to get one because we still had them when we uh, when I got to the teams and so uh, with all the of, accoutrements. <laughs> so we kind of fell into this. I was going to ask you, Mark Twenty Three. Mark 25. I know that you're a big fan of the 226. Yeah. Uh, so I brought some visual aids for the uh, for the interview. Nice, nice, nice. I might run in the other room. Oh, nice. You got the threaded barrel on there too. Sweetness. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this, well, it's not actually Mark 25. This is 226 TAC Ops. Yeah. And then we've got the Legion hanging around. It doesn't want to be left out too, but nice. That'll that'll relate to our M9 versus you know 226 question <laughs> yeah. coming up as yeah. well. I, I definitely have a, a preferred between those two. Um, but yeah, the Mark 23, we still had that when I got in with the laser and the light and the suppressor, which yeah. I remember being <laughs> enormous. Um, yeah, I remember it just being gigantic. And you know, I want one. Pistol. I want, but yeah, exactly. I mean, I want one just because of, you know we used it. But then once we went down range, we still had them in the system uh, after September 11th. But no one. I never saw one downrange. I never saw anybody use one. Yeah, I was very curious. Had yeah. you ever experienced them? Did you ever see them in the armory? Did you ever uh, know oh, we shot them? Yeah, yeah. Use one and liked using it. Uh, so we had them in the inventory. We had uh, yeah setups, holsters, you know, the whole thing, and we went through courses of fire uh, with them before September 11th. It was just part of the part of the workup, part of the you know the the, the different tools that we had available. So we trained with them, but. We didn't really, all we did was train with them on the range. We didn't really, like once it came time to 
uh, actually suit up and put all your stuff on and go do like a, uh, a training run either at a, in a mount facility, so a, a uh, urban warfare training center or just at a kill house or a, uh, which I understand are not called kill houses anymore, um, and then, uh, or land warfare training or whatever. No one wore those. No one used those for those type of scenarios. It was just like static range, kind of fam, you know, run through some courses of fire, run through some stress courses, that sort of thing. At least that was my you know, experience. Other guys might have a different experience, but that was the one, my experience for the for my first two platoons where we did have those in the inventory. And I want one just for the, uh, you know, the, the, the history. Uh, so right. I put one in the, in the collection, but I think it's one of those things that, you know, you got a bunch of people together and everyone gives their input. And then, you know, you still have these requirements for the military. So the military draws with these requirements for a pistol. They put it out for bid. Um, I think this is how it works ish. Uh, and then different companies look at those requirements and say, okay, let's build something and submit it for, for testing. And uh, so there was just so many requirements for this pistol that they all got incorporated. And then you have this gigantic pistol with all these things that no one used when it came time to go do the job. So I think that's kind of how, how that one worked out. Um, but yeah, the, the, uh, the 226 uh, was the, the pistol of choice and really the, the workhorse for my time in the, the teams anyway. And then we had some 228s and we had some 239s uh, as well to choose from, but the, the 226 was really the, the one that was, at least for me, was on my hip for every deployment. I was gonna ask you about the offensive weapons handgun concept and you just kind of like pre-answered it. So, you know, in life <laughs> there's, there's people who have redeeming qualities, you know, they, 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 they come back around and really put it over the top after. And then there's pre-deeming qualities and you just kind of nail it from the beginning. So thanks for doing <laughs> that. But yeah, yeah, obviously marketing works, right? And with HK, they did a phenomenal job. So, you know, as we're, we're talking about, you know, our shared experiences of these, uh, you know, looking at, you know, SOF magazine or, you know, various magazines that had these HK ads in there and just reading that in a world of compromise, some don't. They don't. Yeah, that was awesome. Loved it. Oh Love that. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. And then the Princess Gate one where the guys are, you know, hanging out the side of the embassy and, um, you know, you can see the MP5 right, right there. You know, that, that made the MP5, which is an awesome. Uh, oh, actually, my I'm, goodness. Yeah, I think I'm getting one here at some point. Um, but, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, I love that. But that was fun to, to be able to run with those because that was fantastic. But after, once again, after uh, September 11th, we realized, oh, you need to get to and from a target in these remote areas. And maybe the MP5 is not the thing that you want with you if you're uh, going overland in uh uh, on a mounted patrol in Afghanistan or, or whatever else and something bad happens. So uh, so that was kind of more of the, exactly what we saw at Princess Gate uh, with the SAS is they they were there, they were already there. They, were, they showed up there, they didn't have to really go through right. any sort of denied territory um, or, uh, or non-permissive even. So they just showed up there, which is how we then trained. Um, we, we were like, they were the SWAT team that's just all of a sudden magically outside the door. Uh, and then September 11th happened and we said, oh, those, we're not magically outside these doors. We have to get to and from, and that's oftentimes the most dangerous part of a mission over there is just getting to and from that target. Um, so safety of flight is something that, as a combat leader, I thought about quite a bit, just getting to and from target and all those contingencies because uh, uh, a lot of things can happen along the way there. So um, that was a very long way of saying that we uh, didn't really use the MP5 much in real life after September 11th. We had some SDs that, uh, you know, shoot out lights with or, you know, whatever else. Mm -hmm. uh, those are pretty sweet. But, um, but for the most part, it was all M4s. I did get to do my shipboarding operations in the what was then called the Northern Arabian Gulf right, right off uh, to enforce the UN embargo on ships coming out of Iraq and heading for Iran. So we take those ships down and we had still had MP5s at that time. So I got to use those in, uh, in real life to, uh, to take down those ships, which was, uh, which was pretty cool. Were those SDs as well? No, those were uh, just regular old, we didn't even have, I don't think we didn't even have suppressors on them. No, no, I don't yeah, think we they're all I have to go look back at pictures, but I'm pretty sure it was just MP5. Um, it's with a sans suppressor yeah yeah i mean i have to think these days because that's been a, it's been a moon or two since uh yeah. 2001 when i was doing that 2001 early 2002 uh so gotta uh gotta go back in the memory banks a bit but but that was awesome and for a lot of that we'd sling those um and use the uh 226 because we had a even though they didn't have rails back then we had this uh adapter thing from surefire that uh uh, allowed us to put a light on there and we were clearing these little spaces in these shifts people hide in the weirdest places and uh, For a lot of that we'd use that light on the uh, On the pistol to clear a lot of that just 
regular old white light. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, I, I heard a story where you were clearing a ship right after 2011 or 2001, 9-11, and I was wondering what kind of light was on the gun. I was wondering yeah. how bright was it or wasn't it? Yeah, it's actually in, I think they have, they got it right in uh, this, uh, the Vickers Guide. They actually, they interviewed me for, okay. for this, I got the little, the little thing up, but I think they have the advertisement in there or the, the specs uh, for the actual, um, and I had one, I had one, I can't find it anywhere though. We had, we've moved so many times, um, but I, I, I got, I kept that adapter and, and light, um, but of course, with all these moves, it's, it's crazy, so I don't physically I know where it is right now. I'm hoping it's going to pop up one of these days. Um, because they obviously don't make those anymore. <laughs> Maybe you have a few fan sentiment to you now. You never know, but uh, it's amazing. <laughs> Maybe the other there. guys could kept better track of theirs. Right, right, that haven't uh, moved so many times. It's amazing to see how optics and lighting have changed the game on handguns so much in in just the last five years, let alone the last yeah. uh, 20 years since you know, 9-11. Uh, so I was curious as to how bright that light was or, again, was not. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, we have to go back and look at the specs for it, but I remember it being fairly yellowish. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like like, like the headlights on a, uh, a car from the 80s or 90s, you know, the, yeah, the plastic totally. kind of gets in the sun, gets a little bit yellow. Uh, yeah. For whatever reason, I remember it. It definitely wasn't, you know, a, uh, a bright white or LED or a bluish hued type thing. No, it right. was uh, definitely had a little yellow <laughs> tint to it back then. I've noticed that UFOs uh, seem to keep up with modern lighting technology. Uh, they were very considerate <laughs> back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, yeah. and even early 2000s to have these very yellowish lights. In the sky, uh, right. But now as, as lighting technology has developed, it seems the UFOs also, you know, these aliens want to be considerate of our technology. They're using- They're you know, stealing our technology. Yeah, it's amazing. They're like China. I guess they're just trying to blend in, but uh, you've mentioned the Vickers Guide, uh, yeah, and yeah. we're talking about HK, and we're talking about the MP5 and how the MP5 was was uh, understood to be a bit deficient for a more diverse role that, that needed to be satisfied. And Larry Vickers, working with HK, helped to develop the HK416 from the M4. Have you got any yeah. time on the HK416? Not really. I've shot it, but uh, but I, I always had the uh, you know the M4, and I think that came from like three or four different manufacturers while I was in. I really wish I'd take paid more attention to exactly who was making those low lowers and uppers, you know, and mm -hmm. and uh, if it was the same company or if they were put together at Crane. I got a, a buddy, Monty Leclerc at uh, Centurion Arms, who uh, who uh, kind of makes clones of these things and makes he's awesome and he knows all this stuff, especially on the NSW side of the house. Um, and so he was paying attention to that sort of thing. So if I have a question like that, then I always call Monty um, and ask him because I wasn't paying attention. I wish I took took in closer like pictures closer up, but we didn't have camera. You don't have camera phones back then. So you had to right. you know, pull out your actual camera and then develop a film. Um, right. And then so it, I just don't have the kind of pictures that I would have today if I was uh, still in and had a easy access camera all the time. I could be like, oh, click, 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 you know, and I would have taken a lot more photos of all my different weapons because um, I'm not exactly sure. But but I never went downrange with a 416 uh, or a 417. Um, but uh, mine was always the M4 made by, made by somebody. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's amazing how many people make them. And, and, and then kind of the originator uh, kind of fell out of the game for a while. And then when Colt stopped, you know, producing the M4 or making it available to the public anyway, it's, it's interesting how things yeah. change. Yeah, I did. I know I had a Colt, um, at least lower. Um, and uh, at some point, I mean, I definitely know that was one of the two, three or four that I used over the years. I do know that. Did you see that uh, CZ uh, has acquired Colt? Oh, I did not see that. In a, in a fairly recent development. So huh. uh, it's interesting. Remington going bankrupt. Marlin being acquired by Ruger. Uh, Colt being acquired by CZ. It's very interesting. interesting. Uh, you know, past few months on these types of things. Yeah, I know. I've been busy uh, getting ready to launch the, this novel and working on the scripts for the series and all that sort of thing. So I, I missed that. But uh, that's interesting. I wonder if they're going to what they're going to do to kind of reinvigorate that brand or if they're just going to sell hats and keychains with the, you know, let's say Colt. It'll be very interesting to see what they do. Well, they just came out with the Anaconda again. So they, they did the Python oh, really? years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the new Anaconda. Uh, and apparently it's a phenomenal handgun. Nice. Um, so I, I think they're going to continue to do awesome stuff. Their 1911s right. are fantastic. 
and right. CZ is just amazing. Uh, mm. You know, their shadow pistols and just, I think pretty much everything that CZ makes is phenomenal. So I think yeah, it would be no, a good right thing out. for the end user. Um, I think we live in the good old days for uh, product development as it relates to firearms right now. There's so much amazing stuff uh, yeah. in the market. It's just awesome. Yeah, so, yeah. CZ's always done uh, done great work, um, and they have some fascinating history. I wove a little bit of that into uh, my third novel, Savage Son. I have a CZ in there. Um, I had to reach out to uh, what's called the Bruno. Is that how you say it? Um, so I had to reach yeah. out to the guys at, uh, at CZ. How do you say it? I always mess it up. Bruno. Bruno. So oh. I. So yeah, I'd reach out to them and say, "Hey, I want something that was you know acquired in Africa about this time, maybe used, maybe a couple of years old, uh, and made it over to this country." And so I, I went through the whole history of what I wanted and I said, "What would that you know? What would that be? What would the, would the history of that firearm be?" And so they wrote back, uh, you know, gave me that the info, and I wove that into the storyline. Although I, I've uh, looked into a lot on how you do the research, you will actually go spend time on on uh, location, you know, in a country, in a place where uh you want the character to be uh, yeah yeah i got lucky with this uh this last one because it's mostly continental united states based uh because with covid everything was shut down during the time that i was writing this fourth one but yeah for the second one i went to, to mozambique and then uh a little later i went to south africa helped trained up a uh, an anti-poaching unit focused on mm -hmm. preserving uh, protecting some of the last rhino on earth so Got a lot of great stuff from doing that. I went to Russia for the third one to Kamchatka Peninsula, just south of Siberia. So, uh, so it's important for me to go to these places because oftentimes you don't even know what you're looking for until you're there. Um, and if I had just had a list of questions that I could answer by, you know, going online and looking for those answers, um, you know, yeah, that is one thing. And I could take those same questions, go to the place, and realize, oh my gosh, there's so much more. This was just like a, st a launch point for me to have a conversation with someone who then tells a story that I then incorporate into the novel, but I never would have been able to do that just with a Google search. So it's, uh, it's important for me to go to these places to get that local flavor. Yeah, I, I thought it was interesting to uh, hear you talking about being back in New England, uh, I think in the springtime or the summer and imagining what it's going to look like in the fall. And uh, because your, your story is going to take place during that period of time, it reminded me of someone planning a mission. So it seems like you're planning a book like you might plan a mission I'm not sure if that's true. It just seems like it. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot. There's, the similarities are in really the aggressive problem solving. And uh, on the battlefield, it's about uh, identifying gaps. It's about capitalizing on momentum. Um, it's about adapting to the enemy. That's what they're doing to you. And same thing in pages of a novel. I'm solving problems, and uh, I'm aggressively solving problems in many times. But if I mess it up, the uh, the consequences aren't nearly as dire. I can come back and edit the next day or a week later. Um, so, uh, but you're doing the same thing. You're just you're problem solving, which is kind of like life. Yeah, uh, I hear that life is what happens while you're making other plans. And John, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> Stayed with me. So, speaking of uh, battlefield conditions, uh, you may not want to answer. Uh, which is better, the 9 or the 45 or the AK or the AR. But yeah. if you or maybe uh, James Reese is on the battlefield uh, in a situation and he finds himself unarmed and he happens to come up uh, over an unspotted crest and sitting up there are two uh, battlefield pickup opportunities. One is uh, an M4 of unknown origin and another is an AK of unknown origin. And the, the location is uh, somewhere in the hills of uh, Afghanistan. Which one are you going to pick up and run with? Yeah, so it's a lot of variables there. So uh, obviously his background <laughs> would be similar to mine and that we have a lot more time on the M4. So that's the one that we naturally, you know, go to um, because that's what you've trained up with and gone down range with for 20 years. And that's what you usually have more than jujitsu. We call it mat time, you know, or in the ring, ring time in boxing. Um, so that's the one you have more time with. Um, typically. So that's probably the one you're going to, but obviously you're going to, you know, look at the condition, you're going to check the mag, you're going to make sure that this thing operates. Uh, and, uh, you know, if it's sitting in mud, of course, you're probably going to grab that, uh, that Kalashnikov if it's, uh, if it's sitting there, you know, rusting away in a, in, in a river or something. Um, so, so a lot of variables there, but you probably want to take everything. If you're alone in the hills of Afghanistan, you probably want to leave something, something behind. You're take you're taking it all. Yeah. You might pick up both. And just that's, what I mean, yep. up. that's an option, I guess. Um, I've, uh, I've heard that Dick Marcinko, um, when he was, did, was he the founder of SEAL Team 6? Is that correct? Or one that's of the what I've read, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's what I've read, yes. too. 
but uh, but I've also you know read some other stuff. I just wasn't sure. Uh, no, he's uh, he's definitely the uh, the uh, the driving force behind creating that command, um, no doubt about it. And his uh, yeah, his uh, I guess uh, influence is still still felt there today, much to the chagrin of probably a lot of senior level leaders. But uh, both him and uh, Charlie Beckwith, um, you know, both those guys were the right guys to create those two commands: um, the the Army Tier One unit and the, the Navy tier one counterpart um i mean those guys were just forces of nature and they made it happen and anybody that's been in the military knows what a gigantic bureaucracy it is uh especially when you get up to some of those uh higher levels uh, the politics involved and everything else so uh to be able to create something that was very unpopular in the military at the time uh you know special operations units particularly at that level um, with those budgets and, and everything else uh, those guys made it happen. We all owe them. Everybody that's that's gone into special operations since uh, certainly owes them a debt of gratitude. Very cool to hear. Um, where I was going with that is I, I've heard this rumor that Dick Marcinko had purchased a bunch of stainless steel Mini 14s uh, to use early on, and uh, you know, 18. Mini 14 fans, you know, champion this story. AR guys, you know, sometimes, you know, don't want to hear it or maybe downplay it. I'm wondering if you know anything behind that. I don't. I have to go back and have his uh, uh, his autobiography over there on the on the shelf signed by by him back in the day. Um, I have to go search through that and see what it's uh, what it says. But if I ever get to interview him, I'll ask him about it. Uh, but I'm sure they got, they probably bought a ton of different things to to try out. I mean, yeah. I would guess they went through a whole bunch of, of different uh, different firearms. Um, maybe some one of those guys procuring them saw the A team back in the day. Yeah. Uh, where <laughs> uh, of course, made that that rifle famous, uh, but that's a, a great platform. I mean, it's important for all of us to be, uh, you know, students of weapon craft. Um, oftentimes, you find people in the military that only use a lot of people on the outside think that just because you're a SEAL uh, or Army Special Forces guy that you're you just know all these things about firearms and you know you're into it on the outside and that's just a you know. But that's not really the case. A lot of SEALs just use what they were given. A lot of Army Special Forces guys, same thing, just use what they were given and they don't really know anything else. Um, so for me, I've always been, uh, it's always been important to me to be a student of weapon craft, uh, lifelong student of weapon craft. Um, so it's important to you know, know how to run a wheel gun, you know, getting out there, uh, know, how to, know how to do those things. Um, uh, know how to do, use a double rifle, know how to use a, a back of battalion one super 90, but also an 870 or uh, like, you know, all those different things that you, that uh, that are important if you are uh, if you're a warrior. Yeah, well, even as a uh, civilian, I'm a fan of being able to pick up any gun and run it. Uh, totally, you, know, you appreciate them. You, you know the machinery oh, yeah. behind it. You know it's a weapon system. I like I like operational systems in general. You know, yeah. it's, uh, you know a fine mechanical watch or you know a, a finely tuned vehicle. You know a gun, whatever it happens to be. They, yeah. they work on physical principles. Yeah, and no, exactly. it's, it's fascinating to see the clockwork behind them and, and to be able to interact with them and see physics in motion. So, yeah, yeah. no, I just, uh, I, just I, I meant that as far as like most people would make this assumption that just because you were a SEAL that uh, all of a sudden oh, yeah. you're here. Uh, and a lot of SEALs actually aren't that the greatest with the pistol. We probably spend the least amount of time running that pistol. Um, and uh, so, so just because somebody shows up at the range and has a background in special operations doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna be able to, to drive that pistol uh, as well as you have if you've been training. So it's all about taking that, that, uh, that personal interest in it kind of outside of quote unquote work and, uh, and getting after it on your own. I'm always impressed uh, when people are, are humble and they subject themselves to another teacher. Uh, and I know that you've taken uh, additional training courses to elevate your game on the handgun side of things. And uh, I think that's, that's always a very good thing for everyone to do. I think the best oh, yeah. in the world always do that. And yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I've always done that before the military, while I was in the military, after the military, uh, always building on those skills and, and these guys just trying to, trying to maintain these, the skills, some of these skills these days with so much going on. But uh, uh, yeah, there was one, we didn't really do too much shotgun work. We used a shotgun really as a breaching tool um mm -hmm. from the seal teams anyway and i've had a couple different ones over the years but uh uh and i ran an, an 870 um before i came in the military i did some courses with the 870 just because you know what an awesome 
I mean, just iconic. Uh, yeah. And I have a couple of them here, and just uh, I love that. I love the front of that platform. But uh, but then I never really run in uh, like an auto loading um, shotgun. So I went out, sought out uh, a guy that did uh, Morgan Consulting, who uh, actually got in touch with me. I mentioned him on a podcast like a year ago and reached out reached out to me. So uh, that was really cool to, to reconnect with uh, uh, with him. But uh, yeah, I wanted to learn how to run that uh, at the time, but Benelli M1 Super 90. Um, and what a cool, I mean, that was awesome. <laughs> I love running those things. So uh, so yeah, it's important to, 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 to understand how these different uh, weapon systems operate uh, for a variety of reasons. But yeah, the interest part, but then uh, also, hey, you never know. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think it's it's so much fun. But yeah, you never do know. But uh, I doubt that I'm ever going to be in a situation, uh, you know, where I'm going to have to do a battlefield pickup and and uh, not know how to run the gun just because I won't be in the battlefield situation. But uh, you know, it's fun to it's fun to be able to experience them all and, and use them. But let's talk about long range uh, for a moment. Uh, do you want to let us know what sniper rifles or uh designated marksman rifles you know what what long range tools did you use what do you like what do you prefer for what reasons yeah so sniper school we got there and it, it's probably different today but um we started actually there's a lot more science to it today when i went through it was still the older like vietnam era tactics because we hadn't been in sustained combat since the end of, of vietnam uh these things changed uh fairly significantly over the over the years that we've been learning and adapting on the battlefield, particularly with the sniper weapon systems, but uh, we got there and we got handed that uh, uh, that M14, and we did a uh, a match at Camp Pendleton after the first like couple of weeks of, of training on it. Um, so you're slinging in, you're doing all, all that sort of thing, your iron sights. Uh, so you had to graduate between different rep weapons platforms when I was uh, at, at sniper school. So um, so I think it was your first week or two on uh, that M14, did the competition at Pendleton. Then uh, you came back and then you graduated up to a uh, uh, 762 but, um, from the Remington Custom Shop. And we, they were only for sniper school. We didn't have them once we got back to the, the teams. But uh, it was a yeah, Remington 700, um, uh, 7.62. At the time we had, I think we had a Mark IV on there, Leupold. Um, so you do a week with that, you're doing uh, different yard lines, you're doing your movers, you're doing your unknown distance, and then you graduated to the 300 um, Wim Mag that was uh, McMillan stock, uh, still a Remington 700 action, but put together by the armors at Crane. And uh, that, at the time, also had a, a Leupold Mark IV on there as well. We'd, we'd eventually, you know, I think in 2002 or three, we'd, we'd uh, I think that was when it was, but we went over to, to Night Force uh, around that time. But, uh, but for all my sniper school stuff and for my next deployment with those, uh, it was the, the Leupold Mark IV, um, which I still have a couple. Um, then after that 300, we'd go to, and you do the same things, you're doing unknown distance, you're doing snaps and movers, you're doing these different yard lines, you're, uh, you can, and what we did it up in this, we lived on the range, we had, put, had tents, put tents up, um, just kind of lived out of our cars uh, on this, uh, this range up in the middle of California, and the wind would come up there pretty good, so you got a lot of, uh, got a lot of experience uh, reading wind and, and all that, uh, and then we moved up to the to the fifty to that, uh, and we never had to, had a Barrett. We had um, uh, same thing with Millen and Remington seven hundred action, um, and yeah, those uh, the fifties, um, and uh, and you move up to move up to that and do this do the same things with the fifty. So uh, so that's kind of, was kind of your your arsenal back then, and then when we got back to the team, then we got issued the. Uh, the SR-25, they still called it the SR-25 when I first got it. I don't know if that was, you know, if it was an actual SR-25 or if it's just the, I'm always confused about that Mark 11 designation and when that all of a sudden we started calling it the Mark 11 and if it was exactly the same thing or or not. I have a, once again, a Vickers guide that would probably probably tell me um, in the other room there. But, uh, but yeah, we called it an SR-25 when we got it at the, uh, the team initially and then eventually we started calling it the Mark 11. Um, but yeah, that was, we got that when we got to the team. Now I think, uh, or eventually they started giving those to the guys in sniper school. And I think that happened right after September 11th, I think. But, um, but yeah, so got to, got to then go do sniper sustainment with that thing. So that was great. We went to a couple of different places around the country, did a couple hunts, um, all that just to get, uh, get familiar with that auto loading weapon system, uh, in different terrain and, and, uh, obviously different, different ranges and just get to know it. So those really became the workhorses after September 11th, um, where that, the Mark, Mark 11 and then the Mark 12. Um, so, 
and then I then I don't know what happened after I kind of got back from that last deployment. Uh, yeah, I'm dated now, but uh, <laughs> uh, from my time in, as I was leaving, I saw we had I think we had some Actors International stuff. As I was leaving, we had uh, yeah a few different different uh, sniper weapon systems. As I was leaving, that that we didn't have when I was going downrange. So um, yeah, eventually I'd like to have kind of one of each, you know. Uh, yeah. Maybe, Collection. I actually like to go back and get a bunch of uh, Ken Hackathorn sent me a list the other day. He said uh, he's like, hey, here's what um, the SEAL team guys were using in Vietnam, and uh, it'd be cool to to uh, to get one of the or get one of each of these things for the for the collection. And I was like, yes, it would. So that was cool of him to to do that. But uh, uh, yeah, so it was a you know you get familiar with these different uh, platforms um, in sniper school. Your workhorse really is that 300 Win Mag. That's kind of what it things. Even though we had all those other rifles, um, really everything kind of focused on or around that 300 win mag um, so that's why that's still kind of my, my go-to today um, of course I'd like to get like a 300 PRC and a couple other things uh, as well but uh, but just have so much experience on that 300 win mag that it's uh, you know if I have to go grab one from the other room right now I'm grabbing that mm -hmm. we, uh, would you take a 300 bolt gun over an SR25 if you could only have one you got to grab one go out that door you know, uh, no, I mean, it depends on what I'm going out to to do, but uh, uh, the SR25 Mark 11 is just uh, so much more versatile. Yeah. Uh, allows you know clear clear rooms, and you know I just yeah. So I so I'm I, I'm a fan of options and a fan of versatility. Um, so I, yeah, the, the SR25 just gives you gives you more options. Yeah, when you were out with the 300, uh, in whatever scenario you were in, I would imagine you always have your sidearm with you. Do you also have uh, an M4 backup or like an SR25 backup, something like that? Are are you and your spotter armed differently? Can you tell us what that looks like? Yeah, no, it's uh. So when we when I started, um, it was, we we're still using those Vietnam tactics. So much of it was the uh, shooter spotter type uh, type scenario, both in school, uh, and then when I got out before September 11th, and we I'm sorry got out of sniper school, and we did these sniper sustainment trips. A lot of it still was focused on that uh, you know sniper spotter type uh, type relationship. Um, but in real life, once we got going, that that changed. We you go in, and we'd always have an AW with us. We have an automatic weapon. We have a guy on that. Uh, uh, on that, we'd have um, sometimes you have indig with you, um, so so you can talk to people, especially if you're going into a house or that sort of thing that's occupied. You need someone that speaks the language. So uh, so we went out uh, definitely with more with more people, more firepower. Um, but even when we were training that in that sniper spotter scenario pre September 11th, and those sniper sustainment scenarios, um, uh, we'd have the 301 mag on our back, and then we'd have our M4 um, ready to rock as we patrol into where we were going to, to do that sort of thing. So, uh, so yeah, we'd always uh, have something other than just a uh, bolt action, uh, rifle and a pistol. You'd always have your, something else, your M4 or, or an A-Dub, um, with you as well. Ready to lay it down. Um, that's pretty awesome. Have you shot the 338 Lapua on any platforms recently? I what have. We actually had a guy in our sniper uh, sniper school who was from. He was. I mean, he was awesome. Can't remember his name right now. Um, but uh, he went. He was on his way to the Army Marksmanship Unit, and he had gone through Marine Sniper School. He'd gone through the Army, um, both of their sniper schools, or maybe even three. Um, you know, designated marksman one, and then the SF one. And anyway, he'd done. A, and he was going to Canadian Sniper School, I think, after after he left ours. But he had an Accuracy International uh, 338 Lapua with a uh, Schmidt and Bender scope on it. So I'd never seen anything like that before. And this guy was good. He was the definitely the top shooter in our class. Um, and uh, he went on to the Army Marksmanship Unit and uh, did great things over there from what I understand. But uh, so that was my first time uh, shooting a th uh, 338 well, it was there and I've shot it um, multiple times after. Yeah, definitely don't want to get hit with one. Don't want to get with yeah. anything. Yeah. Yeah, that's not fun. Uh, so, all right, let's talk about pop culture for uh, a minute again here. Um, you talked about Magnum PI uh, before and how, how you kind of had an effect on your uh, thoughts about life and, and writing, I believe. Uh, and you've, you've mentioned some characters, some authors. Uh, I'm gonna mention a name, whether it be an author or a pop culture figure from probably the 80s or 90s. And I'd like you to, to let us know kind of the first thought you have on this 
and then a, a brief description as, as to why. So that'll be the character, what gun you think most uh, or should be associated with them or, or, or reflects y your thoughts about them and why. So oh, wow. We should have done this later in the day. Man, I'd be more confident <laughs> for this. Whew. All right, Magnum PI. I didn't realize there's going to be a test. Magnum, Almost of course. Magnum. Yeah, of course. The uh, you know 1911, of course, is associated totally. you know, with him. Um, and, I couldn't uh, agree more. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, what an iconic show. Uh, and when I talk about that one, most typically I'm talking about one that they, I think it's on. I think I posted it like three or four times on my Instagram, uh, which is at Jack Carr USA. But uh, there's that scene in uh, Did You See the Sunrise when at the end when Ivan's walking away and uh, and Magnum turns around and shoots him. It was the first time in uh, in television history that a protagonist has uh, done away with a bad an unarmed bad guy in prime time. So that was, a, I think it's the best ending to a, to a television episode ever. And uh, yeah, it was, so it was important to me when I was starting to write my novels to have someone, a main character that was likable, that you'd want to sit down and have a beer with, mm -hmm. have a coffee with that sort of thing. Um, and so that, that was why I think that Magnum was so successful because yeah. he was genuinely a likable guy, but then he could flip that switch and get it done like in that episode. So he was human. And everybody connected with him. You know, uh, the guys loved him. The ladies loved him. Um, and uh, and that was important to the success of that show. So that did not go unnoticed um, by me at that age, or uh, as I got into to writing my my novels. Uh, That's important that if someone's going to spend that much time, either listening to an audiobook or in the pages of a physical book, that uh, they want to spend time with someone that they that they like, that they want to have a beer with. Um, I mean, how what do you want to spend days with someone you don't like? So, uh, so that was it. that was important to me to have a, a character that uh, was was human. He likes his coffee like I like mine with a little honey and cream in here, which uh, people make fun of me for, but it's delicious, by the way. Um, but uh, but that was important to me to have a character that had, uh, you know, wasn't the best at everything. He's not that good at the surveillance stuff because um, we don't really do that in the SEAL teams. We do now a little more, but um, but uh, well, certain teams do anyway. But uh, it was important for me not to just make him great at everything so he kind of stumbles around on some of that surveillance type stuff but uh but is very good at uh kicking in the doors and doing the business awesome what kind of gun do you think most fits the character of sonny crockett oh well yeah another another 1911 um stainless uh who made that one the detonics is that, is that who made his i'd have to go back and a lot of stuff on that show and uh yeah i forget who made but uh yeah the door him, that guy, what a great show. I mean, yeah, gosh, and so many like so many iconic yeah. firearms that were that kind of you know only that, that scream eighties. You know, totally, like yeah. when I see a Mac Ten or something like that, I think eighties. You know, oh, me too. Uh, yeah. So there's so many great like, a bunch of pocket guns on that show that you wouldn't find today that aren't made today. Companies that are out of business that used to make things back then. Um, so most of those those uh, those weapons from Miami Vice. They scream 80s, like, you know, Magnum 1911, you know, that's obviously been around for some time and still is around today. So it doesn't, that doesn't scream 80s to me. Um, but man, Miami Vice weaponry, that screams 80s to me. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If you could have a gun that was a, that was a car and the car is a Ferrari Testarossa, I think the gun would be a Bren 10. You know, there we go. That's the Bren. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's the, the Bren 10. Exactly. Exactly. Right. That's the Miami Vice one. Ernest Hemingway. Mm hmm. What do you think he might, what gun do you think might reflect his personality? Oh my goodness. Um, well, there's a book called Hemingway's Guns that I have right over there um, that actually has pictures of, of everything they could find anyway um, of his, which is pretty, pretty amazing. There's a, there's a, uh, a relative of his that's up in Montana that uh, has invited me up to go uh, shoot one of his, um, one of the last couple, well, at least one of the pistols that uh, that that belonged to him that's still in the family. Um, so that that's pretty cool. I mean, go do that very soon. So yeah, it's a Colt Woods similar to the one that I have. Oh, wow. it looks a little different. They they show me pictures of it, but it's um, so it looks a little different. It's a Colt Woodsman, but I think like the barrel's longer or something. But um, so it looks a little different than than mine. But it's about you know same time frame and you know very similar, obviously. Um, but uh, yeah, double rifle, you know, for him for sure for Africa. Um, yeah, just a host. Of course, that iconic photo of him uh, off Cuba with uh, uh, with the Thompson submachine gun. Just an incredible photo. Um, so yeah, he's 
he's uh, yeah very closely associated probably of all authors of the 20th century the one that's most associated with firearms i would say i think I it's think probably it's yeah yeah <laughs> um very cool so if if let's if jack ryan and james reese were going to go shooting together just to have a fun day on the range what do you think they'd shoot yeah well jack ryan's more of the more of an analyst and he's getting he's getting up there in age so uh yeah. <laughs> I haven't read the last. I haven't read the last couple, uh, 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 you know, uh, books that obviously Clancy's not writing anymore because he passed away. But you know, the series continues. Uh, I haven't read the last couple, but uh, uh, yeah, he's more of the analyst, you know. So going to the range, he's getting more of the dog and pony show. Especially yeah. back in the day, uh, he's getting the dog and pony show more than he was going out there and tactically training with the guys with the tactical level operator so um i see him maybe just walking by the table out with a passing interest in uh in some of that sort of thing but then uh but then moving on um definitely a different character than they recreated with the uh, the amazon series where you know he's obviously much more familiar with firearms but um yeah in the uh in the original uh, with the original character yeah he's he's the analyst you know and, and james reese is the operator yeah so what would what would James Reese want to shoot for fun? Oh, for fun, just for fun, man. Even his non gun friend to go shooting with him. Yeah, gosh, come back to the book. I don't think James Reese differentiates. Uh, you know, something for I mean, it's all it's all fun one, and it's all work two. It's all about about uh, no matter what, maximizing your time. Um, and so going out and plinking isn't just something that that he does unless it's uh you know test out someone wants to show him a new suppressor or, or or whatever else you know but it's about going and training um with these different firearms to make that time count rather than just going out and shooting some some cans off a fence or something like that it's not that does that's, that wouldn't be a good use of his his time yeah. um so uh uh yeah for fun is anything probably i mean for fun is anything yeah that's going to increase his knowledge base something that he hasn't shot before uh something he's not as familiar with as some of the other other things so i would say whatever whatever that is um that would be of interest um because yeah because you're always working on those those skills and uh and, yeah uh, if there's an opportunity to shoot something something new or different then he's gonna gonna take that but it's not necessarily fun it's uh it's uh to put in the memory banks uh to know how to use and operate it more effectively in case he ever needs to all right. Well, you've got a book coming out in one week. I do. Um, tell us about uh, that again and where people can buy it. Uh, in addition to that, uh, please let us know about your, your charitable work or the charities you support and how people can get involved to be able to help support you on that mission and, and to help oh. do that good. Thank you. Yeah, there's some there's some great um, foundations out there. And one of the reasons that we're in Park City, Utah is because of the National Ability Center, which is right down the street that uh, takes people of all abilities and disabilities and uh, gets them out in the gets them in the outdoors. Um, and uh, they do a lot of stuff, work with veterans as well uh, and their families, um, guys dealing with uh, post-traumatic stress or uh, dealing with traumatic brain injury or, you know, missing missing limbs, uh, a lot of cases, all three of those things. Um, so that's right down the street. So National Ability Center, that's, uh, uh, they, they do amazing work out there. And then there's a lot of other great ones out there too. Rescue 22 is, uh, is an amazing one that uh, trains up, um, fully trains uh, service and support dogs for people dealing with the emotional and physical trauma of the battlefield. So Rescue 22, incredible. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's very, it's very expensive to train a dog out for somebody, especially a fully trained service dog. Um, and so they do very kind of low, low volume, but those dogs are so are trained up and they get them and get them to people that really need them and they're life changing for those people. So um, that's incredible. Uh, so, so that's a, a great one. Uh, uh, big Hearts Under the Big Sky from the Montana Guides and Outfitters Association. They focus on getting the families of uh, veterans out into the outdoors and so not just taking the veterans somewhere, but taking their families so they can reconnect after a uh, deployment or as they're transitioning out of the military, kind of get to know each other again um, in the outdoors. So there's so many, so many great ones out there um, that, uh, that, uh, that people can, can, can support. Um, so yeah, so do that. And then, uh, uh, yeah, book coming out. So the, the new novel is called The Devil's Hand, right there. And, uh, 
the, each novel has had a distinct theme thus far, anyway. And the first one was really about, uh, it's called The Terminal List, and it was uh, really about revenge without constraint. The second one is called True Believer, and it's really a, a journey of redemption, uh, where the main character needs to learn how to live again, find that next mission in life, the next purpose in life, uh, like we all do, depending on no, no matter what, if we're changing a job or, you're, or uh, you know, maybe a divorce, death of a loved one, whatever it might be, um, there's going to be transition periods in life. So I get to tap into to some of that to, to weave into the storyline. And then Savage Son is the one I wanted to, to write since I was a little kid. And that really pays tribute to The Most Dangerous Game, which is a short story written in 1924 by Richard Connell. And, uh, and I always knew even back in sixth grade that one day I'd write a uh, modern day thriller that paid tribute to that short story. So um, that's the uh, third one I and explore, the, the dark side of man through the dynamic of hunter and hunted in that one. And then for this fourth one, I wanted to take a breath and explore something that I thought about a lot when I was in uniform and then what I continue to think about today just as a, a citizen of this country. And that's what has the enemy learned by watching us on the field of battle for the last 20 years at war? What have they learned by watching us in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria and other hotspots around the world? So I put myself in the enemy's shoes. If I was Iran, if I was China, if I was Russia, if I was North Korea, if I was a super empowered individual, if I was a terrorist organization, what would I have learned by watching this on the field of battle and what would I have incorporated into my battle plan? So that's how it started when I uh, outlined it on the way to and from Russia in 2019, in August of 2019. Um, and I left my computer behind, left my phone behind on that trip because who knows what people have sent me over the years and didn't want to. Uh, uh, didn't want the, the Russians to either confiscate my computer and suck all that stuff out or just have it, you know, suck all that information out as I walk through customs. Um, so I left all that behind and outlined the novel and a notebook. So I got back, incorporated what I'd learned in Russia into Savage Sun, and then started the research for Devil's Hand. And uh, I did a lot of research into infectious diseases and the weaponization of infectious diseases. So that, particularly from the end of World War II up until today, up through today. Uh, like what, what did the Japanese do in World War II? What did they develop? Who did they use it against? What did the Germans do? Where did all that data and research go at the end of the war? How did they inform the US and the Soviet bioweapons programs? Uh, what did becoming signatories of bioweapons conventions in the 70s uh, mean for us and for the Soviets? Um, what happened to all that data and the scientists uh, when, the, the, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed? So, so I was deep into that research when COVID hit. So I was hypersensitive that's uh, what was going on there. And because of the basis of the novel being what the enemy has learned really by watching us on the field of battle, uh, I also know that they're not just watching our response to COVID with a passing interest. They're not just watching what happened in our cities uh, over the summer, uh, this, all the civil unrest with a passing interest and then going about their day. Uh, they're not just watching a contentious political season and election cycle and going about their day. No, they are taking lessons from each one of those things and incorporating that into their battle plan. So because of the basis of the novel, I'm writing this thing in real time as these things are happening uh, and incorporating that into the novel. And then I ran into an issue and that issue was, I got to October-ish, let's say, um, of this last year, 2020, and I was like, man, I'm in the enemy's shoes here. I just sit back and watch. Like, they don't need to do anything. They can just sit back and watch. We're doing a pretty good job of destroying ourselves from the inside. Um, and so I had to figure that out. Once again, the aggressive problem solving. So I figured out a way to, uh, uh, to make it necessary that they strike uh, right now while we're on our knees. So. Um, so yeah, so, I, so once again, you had to got to figure these things out, you know, uh, and that was that was fun to figure figure out. But um, so that's really the basis for the Devil's Hand, and that is coming in hot April thirteenth. Very good. And and where can people buy your book? Anywhere books are sold. So there's uh, on my website right now. There are some independent bookstores that have a uh, pretty cool. Uh, book plate, which is a like a sticker thing that I sign that uh, goes in the book. It's stuck in there. Um, and I try to do that to push business towards independent bookstores uh, who had a very rough year last year, obviously being shut down for, for most of the year. Um, and this one in particular has a pretty cool uh, Kalishnikov on it. So there's a Kalishnikov on there. It says the devil's hand. I sign it. And the Kalishnikov is one that, uh, that I use as a character essentially in the novel near the end and uh, not having as much experience with those as, uh, as others. I wanted to make sure that if an AK person reads it, 
that I got it right. So, uh, so I had to, I got in touch with Jim Fuller. I got in touch with all these guys that know what they're doing. Larry Vickers, Clint Smith. Like I asked all these guys, like how to do this, went down to the park city gun club and, uh, actually ran through it cause they have a, a fully automatic, uh, AK that you can run there on the range. And, uh, so I just want to make sure I got the, the function check, right. Felt it like heard it experienced it but then the uh, the AK that I use is one that's specific to a certain region of the world and obviously there are many variants of the world over um, but this one is specific to a region that uh, that works into the the plot of the novel so um, excellent those are available but but they're available anywhere books are sold in audio and ebook and hardcover and uh, that's yeah April 13th and then I'm at Jack Carr USA on the social channels most active on Instagram um, but I do have Twitter and then I think my Facebook just reposts from Instagram every now and again three was too much for one person to handle like that I, I try to because i try to get back to everybody i try to say thank you because uh for me social media is a way to uh to sincerely thank everyone who's taken a risk on me as a new author and then told a friend because that allows me to continue to do what i love which is is right so i sincerely appreciate people trusting me with their time so um so yeah it's on the socials and then i have a podcast that just launched a couple weeks ago called danger close beyond the books with jack carr and wanted to do that to well, it's another. It's a. It's a way to to reach readers and engage with readers that uh, wasn't available to authors 30 years ago. Um, and in the, this age of social media, I get asked a lot of questions, and a lot of the things that I want to discuss or answer on those uh, aren't necessarily uh, Instagram or Twitter isn't necessarily the best place to discuss some of these things that need a little more, maybe a little more nuance to them, or uh, it'd be helpful if we saw facial expressions or uh, had that intonation of the voice or body language. Um, and uh, you just need to be a little more thoughtful on some of these more contentious issues. So that'll be, the podcast will be the way to, uh, to discuss some of those. So it's just a better, more effective way to uh, to have some of those discussions rather than a you know one sentence response on uh, Twitter or Instagram that someone's gonna interpret however they want to. And a lot of people out there are just looking to, to get, uh, get enraged uh <laughs> it seems like these days anyway so uh, right. so yeah podcast is out there dropping uh, new episodes every wednesday excellent very cool well we look forward to seeing that stuff end up on youtube as well uh yep. you, awesome you know open up an entire new audience you know of, awesome. of patriots who love freedom of speech who love the second amendment and they're gonna they're gonna gobble your content right up oh, uh you. i think your one of your websites sells trinkets, some cool stuff on there. And I think that, that some of the proceeds from those sales go to benefit one of these organizations. Uh, is yep. that Yeah, all of it did. So uh, I, I started it, I guess, over a year ago now. Everybody was asking for, for merch. So I wanted to, I didn't want to just throw up like hats and t-shirts, like the normal stuff. So um, I have some pretty cool stuff on some really cool bookmarks made by a better known company called Direct Action. They have a five, five, six round off the top and they have a little saying on there, uh, run to the sound of the guns and another one, uh, never uh, never tell me the odds, um, which is kind of one of my life mantras. And it's really never pay attention to the odds, but that didn't fit on the, the bookmark. But, <laughs> so, um, so there's those, uh, yeah, bottle breachers, grenades that open, you know, grenade bottle breachers that open beer, uh, beer cans or sodas. Um, so that sort of thing, uh, and uh, the more more things will be dropping, but we couldn't meet the demand. Like it got crazy. It got crazy after around Christmas time. It was just me and my wife, and uh, my wife was like, "All right, no, we can't." I mean, boxes in the bedroom, in the living room, in the kitchen. Like it was just chaos. So, uh, so we're in the process of outsourcing that to a fulfillment center uh, down in Salt Lake that'll be able to handle uh, all that and uh, and handle the customer service side and and do all that. So I'm not I'm trying to get a little smarter this year as because uh, up to this point I've looked at this as a uh, essentially a startup and so you're sprinting and you're building and constantly. Um, but now this year it's time to get a little smarter. So on the merch side of the house that's going to uh, that's going to shift over. But for the first year, yeah, we uh, ran it out of the house and gave everything away to the different foundations that were listed on that the website and it's uh i think it's down now because it's going to get reincorporated into the main site officialjackcar.com uh and that, that's supposed to happen this week but i'm a little skeptical if it's actually going to happen this week we'll see um but it'll be up there soon well it was definitely uh, also cool. job, it was up when i saw it and and you uh, know, it seemed like great gift ideas and it's going towards a good cause so i wanted to help get the word out there too but uh it's yeah. it's jack it's been fantastic talking with you chatting about guns is is yeah. there you'd like to tell the audience before we leave about where you'd like to to see this country go where you'd like to see the second amendment community go any message you want to leave them with 
Yeah. So, gosh, it's so tough. So the main thing that I talk about uh, to my kids or try to bring up as much as possible is how, how important it is to, to study our history and put the requisite time, energy and effort into studying the past uh, to make us uh, well, to be a to give us a little more wisdom as we make decisions that are going to affect future generations. Uh, right now, it seems like a lot of people are basing their opinions and who they vote for off of, you know, 22, uh, uh, how many characters a tweet is, whatever that is, uh, 140 characters, 200 characters, whatever that is. Uh, and they're basing that off someone else's tweet who also did not put the time, energy, and effort into studying the issue and really thinking it through because there's so many distractions out there these days. Um, so what we owe these future generations, our kids, our grandkids, uh, is to put that time in, that mat time in, that ring time in um, to, to studying these issues because people from the inception of this country up through today uh, sacrificed everything so that we could have the options, opportunities, and freedoms that we have. And now, like growing up in the 80s, like we talked about, it seemed like back then, one thing that we could all rally around was the First Amendment. Um, and we rallied around that and people articulated that, hey, I, I, I support your right to say this, especially if I disagree with you. Like that was, that, was, that was one thing that we could all rally around. And now it seems like that's even been weaponized against us. The one thing that we had to rally around as Americans is now also is now being used to divide us, which is a crazy thing to, to think about. But that's why the study of history and understanding why that is in there, just understanding what are our natural rights, um, that these things aren't given to us by the government, that they're not granted by the government, uh, by our employees, by the way, um, uh, that, that, that they are, they are pre-existing and they are natural um, and that we are free citizens. Uh, we're not subjects. Uh, so that, that's the main thing. Like, for people to do that study and then ah, man yeah so that, that that bumps me out a little bit because i see that uh i see that thing we used to rally around now dividing us and can companies now acting but used to act in the spirit of the second amendment even though maybe they didn't didn't have to legally they acted in the spirit of the second amendment now we have companies that have uh have wealth and uh, not necessarily just the wealth part of it, but the control of, of information, more importantly, uh, not acting in the spirit of that First Amendment. So that's a it's a it's a it's a new time. And these next uh, this next decade is going to be very telling as far as uh, First Amendment issues. That's for sure. But First and Second Amendment obviously are intertwined together because one guarantees the other. Um, so. Yeah, put in that time, put in that effort into the, the study of history and talk to that, talk to your kids about that sort of thing as well so that they can make informed decisions going forward. Uh, that's the main thing. And then what I also tell my kids is never miss an opportunity to make somebody's day. Like that's a, I think that's a good one. So uh, yeah, man, thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, we wish you the best of success in your book. Thank you for the thank excellent you. message here at the end. And we hope you have a fantastic day. Thanks for joining me. Again, I'm Sam with utahgetexchange.com and UGE2, youtube.com. And uh, we will be um, hopefully putting more content out uh, to the community and helping to get your message out. Thank you much. Awesome. Take care. Thanks so much. You too.